Well, we're officially into the second year of the science of, and over the past year we've covered parasites in Halo, conchoidal fractures down under, and the real world equivalents of Sonic and Friends. This year, I'm hoping to be able to cover the site in a much wider range of game shows and more. And for the first episode of the second series, I'll be taking a look at the science behind a franchise I've been wanting to cover since the start of the channel. Hello everybody and welcome back to the science of where today we're taking a look at the science behind the latest Star Wars series, The Bad Batch. In case you've not been following Star Wars media outside of the movies, let me give you some background on The Bad Batch. The Bad Batch are a group of clones consisting of Hunter, Wrecker, Crosshair and Tech that were a dropped idea during the original 6 series run of The Clone Wars. These clones aren't like the rest of the Django clones, as they're genetically enhanced to have special skills, including enhanced senses, intelligence and physical strength. Their first appearance would have been as part of the original plans for the 7th series before the show was cancelled in 2014. However, only storyboards and animatics of the original episode exist, and these were shown at Celebration Anaheim in 2015. The Bad Batch series takes place after the last episode of The Clone Wars and Revenge of the Sith and focuses on the adventures of the Bad Batch, invulnerable to the effects of the chip that caused many clones to carry out Order 66, as they make their way into the galaxy and try to find their own way during the rise of the Empire. The existence of the Bad Batch and their new companion brings up an interesting question. First of all, what are the realities of cloning? And what could current cloning and genetic engineering techniques do to create clones with enhanced abilities like the Bad Batch? This means that today we're both looking at cloning in nature and cloning in the lab to see how close we are to genetic variants like the Bad Batch. But before we begin today's video, I'd just like to say if you enjoy it, then make sure to leave a like, comment and subscribe to the channel to see more of the real world science behind your favourite films, games and more. So before we take a look at cloning with test tubes and genetic modification, let's take a look at cloning in nature. Whilst you might imagine cloning as being a sci-fi concept, inside the human body it occurs naturally, with almost all of the cells in your body being replaced with near-identical duplicates thanks to mitosis. This of course depends on the life cycle of a cell, with some cells such as brain cells lasting a lifetime, but other cells such as colon cells only lasting a matter of days. For a version of cloning that's more accurate to the cloning scene throughout the Clone Wars and the Bad Batch series, we can start by looking at the plant and animal kingdoms. Humans have been cloning plants for decades, however, this is known as vegetative propagation. Vegetative propagation is the name given to a form of asexual reproduction in plants, where you can form a new plant from a cutting or fragment of its parent plant. This can be done by taking a stem or leaf from plants that grow genetically identical copies. Scientists have been trying to develop a way of cloning animals for years, with the first truly successful attempt occurring in 1996. And of course, if you're in any way familiar with the subject, you know that I'm going to be talking about Dolly the Sheep. Whilst many of you will have heard this name when you were taking your GCSEs or whatever exams you took between the ages of 14 and 16, I doubt many of you will have learned about what was actually involved in the cloning process. For decades, scientists had tried many different attempts to clone mammals from existing adults and this led to a greater understanding of the process of cell proliferation and differentiation within the mammalian embryo. Specifically, the changes that occur to the DNA during development including gene expression involved in cell specialisation. When the cell is an embryo, it's made up of stem cells. These stem cells are what is known as totipotent, able to become any of the different cells needed to make a complete and viable animal. And for the longest time, this was considered irreversible, though that was proven not to be the case. Dolly was cloned using a mammary gland cell, a unipotent cell that would usually only be able to produce more of the same cell. For this cell to be successfully used in cloning, it needed to be induced to abandon its normal cell cycle of growth and division through withholding nutrients from the cell. Once induced, it became inactive and suitable for fusion with an egg cell. This cell was fused with the unfertilized egg cell, and to ensure that the cell was successfully fertilized, the nucleus was removed from the egg cell. After being fused, the mammary cell's nucleus was transferred to the egg cell, and this began to divide. This led to the successful formation of embryos, but it's still worth noting that this process wasn't successful every time. Out of the 13 ewes used as surrogates, only one had a viable pregnancy. 
After the normal 148 day gestation period, Dolly the sheep was born. This resulted in a perfectly viable child, with functional organs and no obvious illnesses compared to the mother. This process, called somatic cell nuclear division, has since been used to develop a wide variety of mammalian clones. So, from that you might be thinking it's possible to produce clones of humans. But the truth is that SCNT is an inefficient method of cloning, owing to the levels of stress it puts on both the egg cell and the introduced nucleus. This explains why less than 10% of the Dolly clones were successful. And that isn't even the worst of it. The mammary cells used to clone Dolly were introduced to over 277 eggs, with only 29 developing into viable embryos and only one successful pregnancy, meaning they had an efficiency of less than 0.3%. Another key issue is that in SCNT, not all of the donor cell's genetic information is transferred. This process ignores the donor cell's mitochondrial DNA. This means that hybrid cells retain mitochondrial structures from the egg and that the clones are not technically identical copies of the original host. This could lead to a wide variety of issues such as immune response to the non-self mitochondrial DNA, which if you were wanting to use the organ for a transplant, could be very problematic. So that's how cloning basically works, but what about the special abilities of the Bad Batch? As I said at the start of this video, the Bad Batch features clone of Django Fett, but with special abilities, extra strength, enhanced senses, enhanced intelligence, etc etc. But would it be possible to use methods of genetic engineering to get the desired changes that are shown in the Bad Batch? Well, for this, we need to know just how much of these characteristics are controlled for by genetics. Let's start by looking at RECA and how genetic engineering could impact strength. This is a surprisingly easy one to cover. In 2011, scientists at the Salk Institute for Biological Studies found that in mice there was a genome receptor called NCOR1 which was responsible for modulating the strength of muscles. This regulator acts as a brake that decreases the activity of certain genes but can be deactivated with the help of chemicals or mutations which stop this brake and allow for more energy to go to the muscles. Ok so strength, all good. Let's move on to Tech, the member of the Bad Batch with genetically enhanced intelligence. Is there a way that genetics could improve your intelligence? Well, this is a little bit harder to cover because there's been a debate for a long time as to how much of your intelligence is determined by genetics compared to environmental factors. Providing that we go by the idea that it's a roughly 50-50 split, it suggests that Tech's intelligence could be thanks to specialised trainings for all his skill sets. This is not to say that genetic engineering couldn't help intelligence at all, but the sheer expanse of genes that might need to be altered is stunning. In 2018, a study into intelligence identified 206 genomic locations and over a thousand genes that could be associated with cognitive ability. From this, even if you could genetically alter 100 of these genes, the observed effect size for each allele would be minuscule, less than 0.1% even for the strongest effect. So now we know that Echo's intelligence is unlikely to be significantly improved through genetic engineering. What about the leader of the Bad Batch Hunter? Could our senses be significantly impacted by genetic engineering? Whilst you might think that senses are completely dependent on genetics, it's been found that with genetically identical twins, the sense of touch and hearing are not identical, with just over 50% of these senses being accounted for by genetics. Other senses, such as the sense of smell, are far more linked to genetics, thanks to olfactory receptors. These proteins are capable of binding to odour molecules that place a central role in the sense of smell, and genetic changes to these proteins can result in one person perceiving a particular smell in a completely different way to someone else. Now, whilst this is much more significant than the sense of sound and touch, it still involves over 400 olfactory receptor genes to be able to perceive distinct scents. This means that, whilst it's not impossible, it would be very difficult to track down receptors crucial in Hunter's role of a tracker. For example, the OR11A1 receptor is specifically linked to 2 phenkol, found commonly in root vegetables and is responsible for foods like beets tasting and smelling how they do. To get senses like Hunter, you need to find the genes for receptors associated with chemicals present in sweat or pheromones released by creatures. 
the sort of chemicals important in tracking. It wouldn't be impossible to do it, but it would require a much greater depth of knowledge than we have at the moment. So there we go. Whilst cloning has been achieved and occurs all the time in nature, the way it's shown in the Clone Wars hasn't quite yet been achieved and probably won't owing to the many ethical issues involved when cloning a human. And if even a... And even if a clu... A clumen hone... Um, and even if a human clone were successfully produced, you unfortunately wouldn't get the genetic changes seen in the Bad Batch thanks to the wide variety of genes involved with the inner workings of the human body. As always, if you enjoyed this video then don't forget to leave a like, comment and subscribe to the channel. And if you want to help combat the ever-changing and frustrating YouTube algorithm, make sure to share the video to help my channel grow. If you have any scientific subjects or topics that you'd like to see me cover in the future then please tell me in the comments down below. As well as that, follow me on Twitter to get updates on the latest science of videos and join my Discord for chats about science, gaming and more. But until next time, this has been the Science of the Bad Batch. I'll see you next time. Thanks for watching. If you're looking for game based content then you can join me over on Twitch where I live stream 3 times a week playing all manner of games suggested by the community. Or if you want to support the channel even further you can contribute to my Patreon where you'll get behind the scenes access to the creation of all videos as well as being able to vote on what the next science of video will be.